All right, well, let's get started. So welcome again to Tales from the Field. This is volume five. We've had the good fortune to do this uh, many times now and you will keep coming back. I'll, we'll keep doing it as long as people wanna, wanna keep submitting uh, interesting talks that, and stories and tales. And I'm hosting this with uh, Mike Farrow. Uh, Mike, are you around somewhere? Maybe? <laughs> if not, no big deal. Okay, you'll show up eventually, I hope. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce uh, we have 12 speakers, introduce them all, because the way this is gonna work, it's gonna be back to back to back to back. There'll be no live Q&A, no, no session at the end or between or anything like that, like you're probably used to already. Uh, but you can't write questions, apparently. This is, this is news to me, this is great. So you can write questions behind the scenes, essentially, in the, in the uh, Q&A section. There's also a chat, uh, but you can ask questions directly to, to uh, the tale, tale tellers, if they're around anyway, and they'll answer you. But we're also doing a meet and greet right after the symposium. Uh, Tales from the Field, happy, happy, fun time. Hope you can enjoy it, uh, join us for that. It'll be, I don't know, half an hour, an hour, as long as people want to hang around and do things. There's Mike. Hey, hi, Mike. He's drinking. Good. Perfect. Good time to have. So this thing is about an hour and a half long total. There'll be a break towards the middle, 11 minute break. And Mike and I will come back on right before that and remind you, come back in 11 minutes. And we'll get started again. I believe Chris Grinter is, is running these things from, uh, from his computer over in San Francisco. And now I'm going to just say everyone's names, introduce ourselves a little bit, uh, the speakers. So starting us off this time is a, a return speaker, a very good, powerful speaker. Luc LeBlanc gave a great talk last year, very moving. And I hope to see something exciting this time as well. Then we have Jeremy Frank, Erica McAllister. Erica's returning as well from, uh, I think, two years ago. Uh, let me have a uh, 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 triumvirate. We have Andrea Acurio, Lyndon Bentoncourt, and Patricia Jeremio Diaz. We have Aaron Smith, Hans Klumpen. Then we have our 11 minute break. You can uh, stretch a little bit and, and ponder all well, the cool things you just saw. Think about some questions to ask later during the meet and greet. Then we'll come back, kick it off with uh, Kit Prendergast. Then we have a duo, Anthony Cognato and Sarah Smith. Then we have Tonio Gomez. Then we have LaBelle Friedman. Then myself, this time I decided to throw in a, a talk, why not, finally. Uh, Bruno de, de Medeiros is our, is our last speaker there. So I'm now going to go to the next page and let Mike tell us all about the fun, fun rules. So go ahead, Mike. Hope you guys can hear me. Many thanks, Derek. Derek's the ones who did all the work for this. And thanks sure, to sure. everybody who set this up and goes. Um, important stuff. Uh, follow the code of conduct, very important. Uh, use the chat to gossip amongst yourselves, uh, but you must follow that code of conduct. I had a lot of jokes about Lepidopterus, and I've decided to leave those behind, okay? Nothing about, you know, proboscis or scales there. Um, this will be recorded, so, you know, all of those uh, dirty words that you write into the chat, they're going to show up, so make sure they count, um, and, uh, well, follow that code of conduct. The most important thing to do is, is don't show any pictures of insects mating. I think that's really, really important for the rest of this talk. <laughs> I'm gonna be in trouble. <laughs> anyway, anyway. So thank you very much. This is always fun to hear uh, uh, people having adventures. And um, I, I, that's all I've got. Go for it and please, uh, you know, come back after this and, uh, and we'll, have a, we'll have a group chat. It'll be a lot of fun. So Mike, do you have some lovely parting books for our speakers this year? Um, I've, I've sent out an email for anybody who hasn't already received one. Uh, I'm happy to send you a copy of White Waters in Black by uh, 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 Gordon McRae. Uh, if you've already received uh, a White Waters in Black and you're speaking again, Ant Hill Odyssey uh, by Charles... Charles Mann, ooh, I forget his first name, uh, is, is on the list. And then I don't have, I think Luke is speaking for the third time. And I don't, I don't have a, a book yet picked out for him. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you're, if you're speaking and you want a copy, please send me an email and I'll, I'll mail one off to you. And so if you are joining us live, hopefully a lot of you are, at the very, very end, there will be a poll that Cole Grinder has put together very nicely about the Golden Nut Award that we do uh, during this time. And you can vote on your, your favorite tale. Again, no, no pressure storytellers this time as your tale is already pre-recorded, so surprise. But uh, if you've been at ECM before, you know we do this kind of thing. And we also have some runner-up prizes as well. And 
Mike and I have been discussing what to do about it exactly. And we decided this is a great idea. Good job, Nicole. So yes, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out something to, we'll, we'll mail out the items this year and we can announce the winners later, uh, maybe during the business meeting like usual. All right. On that note, I think we are at our five minute time limit. We're ready to start. Chris, what do you think? Sounds great. I just need you to turn off screen share and I'll get rolling. All righty. Thank you, sir. Enjoy everyone. Prior to settling in the US, I worked for 13 years in Africa and Oceania. Through these years, I met and interacted with a few Catholic priests who really stood out as highly unconventional, especially during my two years in Papua New Guinea. Indigenous communities around the world are highly vulnerable to outside threats, such as disease and corrupt people greedy for land and natural resources. While living in PNG, I had the unique opportunity to do field research and interact with the remote indigenous communities of East New Britain. The Binings people were the original First Nations of East New Britain until the Tolai people settled from nearby New Ireland about 500 years ago, presumably displacing them to inland mountains. Their first contact with Westerners was with German Catholic priests in the early 20th century, who eventually established a mission and church in Ransepna. In the 1960s, the Australian administration offered to relocate the Binings communities to coastal areas, promising to build schools, dispensaries, and other infrastructures. During that period, Father Carl Hesse, perhaps envisioning an imminent land dispossession for strip logging, advised the Binding communities not to accept the offer. He seeked for church support in Germany to sponsor the building of an access road, schools and health centers. While living in East New Britain, I wished to sample fruit fly diversity and discover new species in the underexplored inland forests. We established fruit fly lure trapping stations and interception traps to collect my favorite pet Hymenoptera. My former employer, John Huber, reported that my samples contained the highest diversity in number of genera of my Maridae he had ever recovered from any sampling site. The Binings people, fewer than 10,000 in total, live off subsistence agriculture and hunting as scattered communities, the largest of which is around Sepna. The whole region is still extensively forested with a vast underground network of unexplored limestone caves. I was privileged to establish good ties with a number of Kaket people, such as traditional chief Lucas and Chris Mitparingi, who would accompany me during fieldwork. Ben from Manus Island was a school principal the children knew me well, especially from the day I brought to them an actual soccer ball as replacement to the one made of garbage bags they used to play with. I became good friend with Father Theo Vogelpot, then the priest in function in Ransetna, who would provide invaluable insight about the culture of the little known bindings people. Kaket language is notoriously complex and difficult to learn. The only word of it I remember is asilongai, which means fruit fly. Traditional spirituality and mask dances are still predominant in the Binding's culture. I was privileged to be invited to see the sacred Ovenka shrines, where they spend months meticulously crafting their elaborate masks. Here they are in action.
Their church services are also quite unconventional. an anthropological account of the Binding's people with precision and details that only Germans can best achieve. He is now a retired wise elder still living in Rabal, Papua New Guinea. I remember Father Theo once saying to me, I encourage them to practice their dances and preserve their spirituality, keeps them healthy and away from drinking. He is now retired back in Germany. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everybody and happy Halloween. Well, by the time you're hearing this, it'll be a little bit after Halloween, but at the time I'm recording it, it's Halloween Eve, which makes this the perfect time for a tale of terror. Insects, of course, are classic creatures from creature features. Whether they're growing to enormous size in terrorizing cities, or simply crawling around crypts, caverns, and tombs, terrifying the living daylights out of anyone who happens to be unfortunate enough to be inside, Insects have a long history of scaring horror movie goers. But not us, right? After all, we're insect collectors, much more likely to be fascinated than frightened by insects. But if you think about it, we're almost the perfect victims for such horror movies. After all, we like going to strange and unusual locations and getting so distracted by the interesting bugs that we find there that we don't notice anything that might be creeping up behind us, ready to strike. But then again, this is real life, not a horror movie. Horror movies have very specific setups that you're unlikely to encounter in real life. First of all, you need to have an isolated location for the film to take place, far from any assistance for the protagonists, the sort of place where no one can hear you scream. Secondly, there are always rumors about a monster or dangerous creature circulating. And Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, you need to have someone clueless enough to ignore the first two things and plunge headlong into that situation anyway. Unrealistic, right? Now, on a totally unrelated note, I'd like to share the story of my first ever collecting trip as an independent graduate student. I was hot on the trail of these beautiful beasts, sand wasps, which I was studying for my dissertation. So I decided to book a stay at a research station where I knew they'd been collected before. And as I booked my stay, the research station staff asked me if I wanted to stay in the cabin. The cabin, apparently, was located in perfect sand wasp territory. It also just so happened to be located about a mile out from the main station and of much of anything. 
Of course, it looked much nicer than the abandoned house I'm showing in this photo, but I'm trying to set a mood here. In addition, they also said, if you're going to stay in the cabin, please be careful because bears have been sighted in the area. And in response to being told that I might be staying in an isolated cabin surrounded by bears, I said, okay, I can handle that. You may now be getting a sense of where this is going. On my first day at the research station, I decided to walk down from my lovely cabin to go see if I could get some breakfast at the main station. But on my way, I noticed a trail that I hadn't seen the day before when I was heading up to the cabin. I didn't know what that trail led to, but I could tell it was leading to some beautiful sand wasp habitat because the soil was just right. And so, perhaps unwisely, I decided, might as well go up it. What's the worst that could happen? This is the part where you're supposed to be mouthing, no, don't do it. Well, as I walked up that trail, I did find something. Not sand wasps, but tracks in the sand. I'm an entomologist, not a mammologist, so I couldn't tell exactly what had left them, but I could tell it was something pretty large. And I said, eh, it was probably one of the bears and I don't see a bear around right now, so I'm fine. As I continued up the trail, I found something else. A mysterious scrap of rotting flesh left in the middle of the trail, represented here by this lovely photo of a skull. I couldn't tell how that scrap of rotting flesh had come to be there or what exactly it had come from, but the gears in my mind started to turn and I said, a scrap of rotting flesh means there are going to be flies and flies are the preferred food of sand wasps. This is a perfect situation for me to be in. So I settled happily down to go look for some sand wasps. But no sooner had I done so, then I started to get the eerie sense that I was being watched. And I realized all too late that I had forgotten something else the station managers had told me. They said, it's rare, but just so you know, sometimes we do see mountain lions here. And as I looked behind me to see a mountain lion a little bit off in the distance, but still entirely too close for comfort, I really wished I'd remembered that before. Well, finding myself suddenly in contact with the creature of this sudden creature feature, I took stock of what I had available. I had with me one cell phone, no service, of course, when is there ever cell phone service in a horror film, and two, an insect net and jar of ethyl acetate. Well, after briefly wondering whether or not I should try to fight the monster, I decided that I was not going to be inventing a new and innovative form of insect net martial arts that day, and instead I decided to take a page from another classic horror movie idea and run away. Well, spoiler alert for the ending of this gripping film, I made it back to the main station just fine. Now, whether or not I was ever in any real danger, I don't know. In retrospect, I have the idea that the mountain lion was probably just as surprised to see me as I was surprised to see it. But maybe, just maybe, it stalked me all the way back to the main station and I just barely escaped the jaws of death. Probably not, though. All the same, I learned an important lesson that day. No, not that I shouldn't go down mysterious trails, and no, not that I should be paying attention to animals other than sand wasps that sometimes. I learned something else. I learned that I should never question horror movie protagonists when they're doing ridiculous things like diving right into the den of a monster or lair of a serial killer without seemingly a thought in their clueless little heads. They probably are thinking of something. They're probably thinking, hey, there might be sand wasps in there. Thanks for listening, folks, and please don't do what I did. Hello everyone, um, welcome to my ship in uh, South London, uh, a very exotic and salubrious uh, location for an exotic and salubrious talk about bot flies. So my name is Eric McAllister, I'm one of the curators of flies and fleas at the Natural History Museum in London and I'm just doing a little bit about uh, a film work experience that I had. But I, I'm very lucky, I work with an amazing collection of flies. And I love them, look at them, adorable, 
I mean, who doesn't like flies? Well, this fly is from one of the, uh, is a fly species in the family Oostidae, which is a bot fly. And this little cutie is an adorable reindeer bot fly. So just coming up for Christmas, wondering why Rudolph's have a little red nose? Maybe because of these little creatures. But there are quite a few species of uh, bot fly. Here's a, another little cutie. Look at this one. Isn't it adorable? But it's not that one I will be talking about. In fact, it's this one here, Dermatobia hominis. Now this is the human bot fly. This is quite exciting. This is a species that actually likes us, which is quite unusual in the animal kingdom. And it's quite a fun specimen to come across, whether it's in the collection or not. So here is part of the collection at the Natural History Museum. This is the adult stage, apart from we have one little desiccated larvae just over there. And we don't really have that many adults in the collection because it's not really the adults that we know and love in the field. Now, I'm very lucky as part of my job, I get to do loads of field work all around the world. Here's just some examples of where I've been collecting. Um, I have a little soft spot for the uh, Neotropics, so Central and South America is one of my favourites to go to, and I, I will try and get there as much as I can. But it's not just me that likes hanging out there, no, it's the human bot fly as well. And if you see in Central America one of those little blue dots there, it's Costa Rica, a country renowned for its splendour and its beauty. And I, I've loved it. I've been, I collected over there for three years. It was wonderful being stuck in the, some of the northern rainforest. Look at me there. I am happy, absolutely covered in mud. Couldn't get a much happier person. I've just spent hours digging through traps, trying to find insects, all sorts of things. This is my beautiful field station. And oh, look, there's a wonderfully engorged mosquito. That mosquito had engorged on my blood. I donated a little bit of myself to help her carry on her next generation. So mosquitoes are, are quite notoriously bad in, in many situations and it's not just their fault because they are used so much as vectors for transferring things that we don't like such as dengue and malaria and all sorts of things. But bless them, that's not all they transmit. Those wonderfully big bot flies that we saw earlier are big, big chunky flies. And the whole thing about these chunky flies is they're noisy, right? They can't exactly creep up on us because it's going on. So what they do, they grab another fly that is known to haunt the human body. And what is better than a little mosquito? We rarely know if a mosquito is feeding on us till after the event. So you can see here, this is one of the mosquitoes in the collection and in glue, glued to the side of it, you've got some botfly eggs. So the female botfly, the mother, has grabbed a mosquito and she's laid her eggs on the mosquito. So when the mosquito is able to surreptitiously come up to you and start feeding, these can drip off. So not only can you get dengue, but you can get a botfly as well. That is nature at its finest. So, my story in the film starts with this fine fellow. He's a, he's a really good American, um, except for he's a primatologist, but I let it off because he's quite fun in many other aspects. But he's not so good when it comes to the smaller things in life. He came up to me one day complaining about noises at night, and then he realised what was happening in that fine head of his he was fostering another life. So he was um, rather vocal about it. I was obviously ecstatic and he was, no, he wasn't. In fact, he, he says some very rude things, some of them concerning my mother. I was a bit offended, I was like, mate, yeah, whatever. But he was like, Erica, if you don't get this butterfly out of my head, I will, and I can't repeat the rest of the sentence, but I think you know what it is. So I was a bit disappointed because like, this is great. We could have grown our own bot fly. It would have been amazing, but nope, he's a bit of a wimp. So it was like, okay. So what I did is I put some Vaseline over the top of his head and the two little anus spiracles that enable this little bot fly to breathe. Couldn't do it anymore. So oh, the bot fly died. 
Now he, he'd been moaning because he'd also been seasoned going down the slide. But the thing about botfly larvae is that they've got rear facing spines. So you can't just pop them out. You actually have to slightly cut open to pull them out. Now I'm not totally uncaring. So I let him drink half a bottle of rum to numb the pain. However, although I'm not uncaring, I'm a bit stupid in some aspects because I forgot to let him have time for the alcohol to take effect. Oops, so that was a bit of a mistake, number one. So there I am, slicing gently over his head. He's screaming, the student, because obviously this is a field course and he and I are the tutors, the adults of the field course, the students, Students are like, oh my god, oh my god, this is, oh, oh no, and I'm like, it's fine, it's fine, do this all the time. And I have then <laughs> managed to get most of it, you have to be really careful because bits fall off, and most of it out. Now, this is quite a mature bot fly, and I was like, yeah, this is really exciting. But sadly, we didn't manage to collect it. My friend has reared some. We all know some very famous entomologists who've actually gone through and reared them. But sadly, we don't often get him out of state. Here's one that I prepared earlier because I couldn't find the original one from my friend's head. This came via the museum, via the editor of BBC Wildlife magazine. So quite a reputable magazine who on honeymoon in Belize, his wife had got one. He didn't say where, but he managed to extract it from her not so happy body as well and he kindly brought it into the museum. Now this may seem a bit silly and may seem a bit dark, but it's really handy for us to have these collections in the museum. And as all good scientists, I have a little jar of bot flies here. So next time you go into the field and you find yourself with one of these, ignore the noises of the night, ignore the thesis falling down your forehead. And remember that one day you too can become part of a museum collection. Thank you. The Galapagos Islands are well known for their finches, giant tortoises and the theory of evolution by Charles Darwin. Little is known about the great diversity of insects, 56% are endemic species. Invertebrates are important in the ecosystem. Accidentally introduced species can affect human health, crops and harm endangered and endemic species. The invertebrate collection is one of the four natural history collections of the Galapagos, from which the Charles Darwin Foundation is custodian in collaboration with the Galapagos National Park Decorant. The ICCDRS field trips wouldn't be possible thanks to logistical support from CDF research teams working in unexplored areas of the archipelago. Field trips require the team and their equipment to be transported generally to uninhabited locations. This accomplishment is thanks to support of the Galapagos National Park. Each expedition requires permits. We strictly follow field work protocols established for each island. This will be a short but bumpy boat ride to Floriana Island, also known as Charles Island, and has a population of around 150 people. Our field work will take place in Black Gravel Mine, which was a barren area for decades. In 2014, the CDF Galapagos Verde 2050 project started an ecological restoration program with Galapagos endemic plants. Four years later and the vegetation is growing again. We use varied methods of collecting insects during the day, and for nocturnal insects we use light traps. The samples are carefully packed for the return trip. In four days the team collected 49 species of terrestrial invertebrates. Some introduced species are the Necrophagus flesh fly, which is the most abundant species, the ectoparasitic fly, whose larvae resides in birds' nests, it is a serious threat for the mangrove finch, and the African fig fly, a pest that affects 60 different crops worldwide. Unfortunately, this is a new species record in Floriana Island. 
Some endemic species are the Galapagos carpet of Eve, a major pollinator in the island, the Galapagos scorpion, a predator that's good at keeping the balance in insect populations, and the Galapagos endemic land snail. Let's preserve all these materials and data, which will allow us to track the ecological restoration process of black gravel mine. These specimens will be useful for researchers working in the control of introduced species and the conservation of endemic terrestrial invertebrates in the Galapagos Islands. Right. Hello, um, thanks for coming to my virtual talk. I'm going to be talking about a couple of experiences we had uh, collecting in Southern Africa, South Africa in particular, and I've added my two partners in crime who came along on these two different tri trips to the talk, uh, particularly because they lived the experience and shared pictures with me. So. Uh, as some of you may know, I've been working, I and my lab, on uh, phylogeny of the Tenebrionid subfamily Pemeliani for quite a few years. And here's our tree from last year. Uh, we now have 288 more taxa off being sequenced right now. Uh, so this tree will grow quite a bit. But this is a large subfamily of predominantly flightless desert dwelling beetles. And when you pull out just the African taxa in this tree, they're spread across the whole phylogeny. Uh, some of the tribes are entirely African. Uh, so it's an important part of this. And in fact, a lot of the things that we're waiting for sequences from are more African taxa. So again, a shout out to my collaborators. Uh, this is a group from a lot of different countries and we've taken some pretty neat trips around different xeric habitats. But I'm just going to focus on this one bit of South Africa. So I'll point out South African collecting is a great way to spend your time. Now, we usually get these bush lure trucks. They're four by four and have tents on top, it's pretty cool. So you can stop places and camp on top of your truck. Uh, and I really recommend going. Uh, the permitting is not as difficult as I've heard in other places. Uh, and it's just a wonderful place to visit. So in particular, where I'd been wanting to go for a while was this Debaris Dunes. And Debaris shows up in Google Maps uh, though it doesn't search well in Google search. And this the Barris Dunes has been labeled both from Namibia and from South Africa. But the one in Namibia is in the Spurgen Bight, uh, which is a forbidden zone that you can't really get into, whereas this one is pretty accessible. And this, this version of Debaris Dunes is the one that I think is right for most of the labels I've seen, uh, as it's close to this town, Lekersing, which apparently means nice song in Afrikaans. Um, go figure. So, and that's close to Port Nolith. It's off of a regular road, and then it's just up several dirt roads into this nice little dune region. All right, and my reason for going there started with the genus Macla, one of the groups we're revising. And there are multiple undescribed species from this small area. Most of them are known from only one or two individuals. Some of them are 100 years old, uh, the specimens that is. So I really wanted to check it out. And I thought any place that has this many undescribed species in a single genus 
must have other cool stuff, right? So we went the first time in May 2017 with my friend Ron Smith, who's an amateur entomologist uh, who had just wanted to go and mostly take pictures. So thankfully he did. Uh, yeah, so here it is. This is uh, where the truck is, is outside of the dune region but heading in. Uh, and then these are what the dunes look like. They're, they're really very low dunes. They're not, you know, big fancy ones, uh, but beautiful nonetheless and really neat for a taxa. What I'll say is a lot of times when you're driving up a large dune, it's obvious that the sand is going to be sandy. When the dunes are very low, uh, it's not so obvious how easy it is to get stuck. So, and we did get stuck. I'll just stop there and say uh, in 2017, we got stuck for only a couple of hours uh, because thankfully uh, my collaborator Ron grew up in Nevada uh, going out on the dunes all the time and was really uh, confident about getting trucks unstuck, unlike me. So he was the driving force in making sure we got out and we played it safe and left. In October 2019, uh, Marcin Kaminsky and I decided to go back to this place because we had gotten some really good taxa in 2017 and it was May. So we thought maybe if we go back in October, it would be very different. So here is heading into the area. And again, what's not clear from that picture is that these roads are actually very sandy and they get sandy very quickly. So here's a nice road picture as you will. And pretty quickly, we got stuck as we went in and we stopped like any good entomologist and collected for a while. And then we're able to get the truck out fairly easily. Uh, so we felt confident. This was twice that I had gotten stuck in, this in these dunes and been able to get out. So we drove a little further and got truly stuck. Uh, here you can see we actually probably made the whole thing worse as we tried to get the truck out. Um, but we still stopped and collected and dug on the truck periodically for about six hours, I think. Um, yeah, until uh, we got really, really stuck. And I'm going to share this video from Marcin because it kind of encapsulates it. Uh, I'll say at the end, he says something in Polish and I haven't asked him what it is, but it may be uh, we're screwed. Not sure. So let's see if this plays. So, at this point, um, we realized we could not get the truck unstuck. We were only 17 kilometers or so from Lekersing, which is a very tiny town with no obvious stores or anything else. And this was a Sunday night. Uh, but we were 76 kilometers from the nearest main town, Port Nolith. So we stayed until uh, after dark because it was incredibly hot in the daytime and geared ourselves up to walk first to Leckersing and see if anyone in the middle of the night would help us in this small town, figuring that we might have to go all the way to try to walk to Port Nolith. Uh, which is a really long distance. I think, what was it, 46 miles, I believe. Uh, yeah, so quite a ways. And we got all of our water, our last remaining beer, uh, and our snacks, and set out along the road um, and collected along the way, obviously. 
but thankfully about three kilometers on when we hit where two roads met, we saw a truck just driving down and we saw lights and we were so happy. So we waved the people down and it turned out to be uh, three Nama men, uh, the, the local indigenous group uh, in a pickup uh, driving apparently from Port Nolith over to Namibia. And they thankfully said they would help us uh, get the truck out. So I, unfortunately I don't have pictures of this because uh, I thought it would be awkward to take pictures of people in the middle of the night. But these guys were pros. They drove us back to our truck uh, incredibly fast uh, while blaring trance music, which was interesting. Uh, jumped out, looked at the truck, started digging. Uh, unlike us, they were not scared of the Widowmaker Jack, the big crane jack. Uh, even though the first time they tried it, the truck did collapse back down into the sand. No one was hurt. So basically they knew what to do, uh, lifted the truck again, uh, set it up properly and one of them skillfully drove it out of the big hole we had dug for ourselves. Uh, we were incredibly grateful and gave them our last beer and some cash. Uh, they laughed at us and uh, headed on their way. So we drove back to Port Nolith uh, about 2 a.m., got a good night's sleep, went on the next day to Richtersfeld National Park where the collecting was actually not that great because they'd been in this multi-year drought. And we thought, ooh, maybe we could go back to Deberis and try again, which we did. Uh, but this time we stayed about two kilometers off the dunes and walked ourselves in uh, and had a, a great time. So really we went there three times. Um, again, not as dramatic as some people's field stories, but uh, still fun nonetheless. Ah. So one question, was it worth it? I mean, you know, we did almost get stuck uh, tragically the second time, but of course it was worth it. Right? Both trips, we got uh, completely different taxa. Uh, we got many things for sequencing, several potentially undescribed species. Most of the things we collected there are only known from the Stabaris region. And it is the only place that we got Cognathus, which was both critical for our tree and something that I'd been wanting to see every single time we went to Southern Africa. Uh, and here's a picture of two different uh, genera of Adelastomini uh, cuddling up to each other underneath a bush while we were there. Uh, yeah, so Last thing, uh, I'm giving this talk while in quarantine for coronavirus. Yay! So everybody stay safe and I really hope to see you next year. All right, questions? I know you can't really ask questions virtually, but thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Okay, a brief note on uh, some odd uh, experience that I had while collecting in uh, Colombia. Okay, the thing that I wanted in Colombia was uh, specimens of a new species, probably representing a new genus, probably a new family of heterozarconids. Uh, heterozarconids are uh, uh, mesostigmatid mites. Um, you have an example of them here. Uh, these normally have a pair of really large suckers here. These do not have that. This is a very primitive genus within the family. I wanted them. Um, these mites are associated with millipedes uh, and the only material I had was quite old material in the field museum. And those specimens came from the west coast of Colombia from the Choco uh, department and from the west coast of Ecuador. So that seemed like the place to go if I wanted more material. However, of course, that part of Colombia uh, did suffer from quite a bit of guerrilla activity and war activity during the civil war there. 
Um, so that was delayed for a good long number of years, but by 2010, some uh, Colombian colleagues assured me that things had calmed down there. There was no more uh, guerrilla activity, so maybe it was possible to go. Um, goal, very simple, collect millipedes, check the millipedes for mites, um, get the mites and do a little bit of general litter, litter collecting. Uh, so here is one of the, the millipedes, fairly large millipedes. Um, the, normally speaking, this kind of collecting uh, doesn't really raise a lot of eyebrows here. It should be fairly straightforward. So we went to uh, Choco province, to the capital, Kipdo, uh, working with some folks at the University of uh, Choco. Um, and wanted to go and work at the field station there because that seemed like a nice and safe, secure situation. The field station is in Tutunendo. Tutunendo, a very small town, uh, famous predominantly because it's usually listed among the 10 wettest places on earth. And I can assure you, yes, it is. Um, but the field station itself had nice facilities. So in here, uh, some of my uh, Colombian students that are working with me uh, nice space to work. Uh, it had electricity. It occasionally even had running water. Uh, so all kind of great things. And everything seemed like fairly straightforward, no more than the usual problems. Um, until we actually arrived at that field station, one of the things that I noticed was, hey, there's a couple of soldiers walking around. And then I found out that I had a security detail. In fact, 35 uh, members of the Colombian military that had been assigned to me. Every time I left the station, I had anywhere from two to seven of soldiers with me with assault rifles, uh, which is just disconcerting for somebody that normally goes out with a couple of Ziploc baggies. Um, I want to stress here, I never asked for this. The local governor seemed to have thought that an American out there uh, might be a good target for kidnapping and ransom. So he assigned these folks to me. I never asked for it. And I don't believe I was that much in that much danger anyway. Um, the soldiers did help the project. They really did enjoy sort of walking around and, and breaking up logs and you know, doing that kind of stuff. They, they, they got into it. And so they got me a lot of millipedes uh, uh, in that way. And finally, uh, just mentioning, yes, I did get the mites I was looking for. So the whole enterprise was a success. Be it, but a success. Hey everybody, so hope you enjoyed all those from the chat. Looks like uh, you did, it was fantastic. So now we're gonna have an 11 minute break and we'll be back at uh, 10.02 as GMT-8 or Pacific time United States for those of you not tracking with all that. I'm just gonna sit here, we can talk I guess for a little bit, is that okay Chris? Is that what usually happens during the breaks? I'm gonna pop up one of our sponsor videos from BioCup and okay. thank them. And um, we can go grab some coffee or something and sure. be back in a few minutes. Cool. Great, thank you. Keep chatting if you like. Yep.
We're really gonna miss seeing you this year in Orlando. But have you ever wondered where your cabinets, drawers, and nets come from? Well, wonder no more, because this is BioQuip. I thought maybe you'd like to see what happens when you place an order, see how things are produced, and see how things are shipped. Come on, follow me in. So your order starts here with these wonderful folks. Whether you've ordered online, maybe over the phone, sent us a PO, these are the people you'll talk to. Hey, Selena, do you have anything for me to take to the back? Yeah. Let's head on over to the tube. Yes, hello. Your order, along with some others, are now ready to go back to where the action happens. Meet the tube. Another order coming through, guys. So let's head down to the BioQuip production floor. This is where the magic happens. Quick shout out to the bug room. Oftentimes, before we send something to you, we have to make it. Cabinets, drawers, nets, cages. Welcome to the wood shop. Keep up the good work, Abel. Sometimes we have to do some electrical work too. Traps, black lights. If you've ordered any of those, chances are you've met my good friend Angel before. Hi. Once things are produced, they're ready to be shipped out. Let's go see how that happens. Speaking of shipping, your order's here. It's time to get some exercise and fill this order. Printing boards, check. Box of pins. Everybody needs pins. Time to build a net. Handle, ring, bag, check. Last but not least, one drawer. Time to box things up. Elsie, I have another one for you. Great. Oh. Okay, I take it. Elsie, she's the one who gets okay. it done. Order's boxed up and it's ready to go. All we need to do now is send it off by mail. Oh, hey, well, now it's time that we got your merchandise off to you. So put her on the truck, Steve. Time to bid you farewell from the BioQuip showroom. It's busy in the back, but it's a little quiet up front. It feels a little like Orlando. But with any luck, we'll see you all again next year, 2021, in Denver. We better stop vamping and let Chris get this show on the road again. All right, Chris? Yep, here we go. Sweet. G'day, ladies and gentlemen, chills and blokes. I'm Kit Prendergast, also known as the Bay Bay Vet, and today I'm going to leave you buzzing about Amagilla Dorsoni. So, I'm a native bee scientist from the land down under, otherwise known as Australia. And my tale from the field were invo will involve an adventure to discover Amagilla Dorsoni. This was a bit of a diversion from my PhD study. The title is there for you to read, it's rather lengthy. So I was in the middle of my PhD. It was all going quite well um, for a PhD. I was loving studying native bees, but there were a few other um, extra things going in, on in my life, a bit of a heartbreak. And so I took this opportunity to go study one of Australia's most amazing bees. 
Dr. Um, Professor Stephen Boochman Busman and his partner Kay Richard were coming to Australia from Arizona to study this bee and he'd been in contact with me and I'd been giving him a bit of advice about the weather whether it was good to come and study this bee because I only had a short period of time to study it and then two weeks before they were about to arrive I was like this is an amazing opportunity so I got in my, my Nissan Pulsar and drove up to Carnarvon to help them study it. So why Amagilla Dorsoni? Well, this is an amazing bee. Amagilla Azaripoda Dorsoni was on my bucket list of bees to see for since forever. It was probably the first bee that really got me excited and enthralled about native bees because Unfortunately, like most people, all I knew about was the European honeybee, but in undergrad at University of Western Australia, I'd been introduced to this bee because it had alternative mating strategies with minor males that um, snuck around on flowers waiting for females to come, and the major males that battled it out to get mating rights with virgin females emerging from their nests. And it was made famous by Sir David Attenborough. So I drove up from Perth in southwest Western Australia all the way up to Carnarvon. Australia is a big country, so this trip can be um, done in one day, um, takes about nine hours, but if you're me, it definitely can't be done in one day because I have to stop off at all the amazing patches of wildflowers on the side of the road. So I drove to Geraldton first, stayed at this beautiful bucolic homestead, I made friends with baby lambs and as I mentioned stopped off to see lots of native bees along the way. First day. So I arrived the day before Steve and Kay arrived and I got in contact with a local Indigenous woman, Tony, who allowed me to see the first bees of Amagula Dorsoni. Uh, so that we looked at a clay pan um, which was on a rifle range and also an off-road clay track. These bees don't nest in pristine, beautiful wilderness areas. They nest in some rather um, unexpected places, but that's bees for you. Um, I also saved the life of a bobtail skink. So that was my achievement for the day. He wasn't all that um, appreciative. He just gave me a big hiss. <laughs> They're quite common in Australia and they are one of my favorite little skinks or rather large skinks actually. So day two, this is when I met Stephen Kay and I was uh, pleasantly surprised um, because in Australia we don't have uh, great opinions about Americans um, largely because of a rather unpleasant um, president but uh, I was absolutely um, amazed and adored these two Arizonian colleagues and I became really good friends with them. Uh, so I introduced them to Amagula Dorsoni and I felt really proud that I could share um, my, my knowledge of the native bees here in Australia with them and show them the sites that they were looking for. I also went on a morning jog that day and found this bee foraging on plants just along the side of the road. So that was also really exciting because I had this impression that they would all be in pristine wilderness areas. Uh, we also made some new host records for this bee um, and uh, lots of mating activity, which was exciting. I was there filming it. Uh, felt a bit like a voyeur, but uh, it was very exciting. And, you know, if we have no bee sex, then we have no more Amagula dorsoni. And then you can also see a photo of these major males about to get in a battle. So lots of filming of bee sex. Our objective was to determine the mating sequence and duration. And I think we recorded a uh, Guinness World Record for bee sex. Um, these guys mate for a long time, uh, over nine minutes. So quite impressive there. Day three, more advancing the science of bee sex. This time it was recording what sounds they were making. Now this was easier said than done because on the clay pan it was actually very windy. So we set up a recording studio in the ute 
Uh, Steve had his specialized recording equipment. I was the uh, basic chaperone. I was waiting on the clay pan to see when two um, bees would pair up and they'd scuttle along the clay pan. And when they got to patch of grass, I'd pick them up in my hands and take them to the mating arena. Uh, there was also a bit of an excitement that day because there was a detective on the pistol range looking at some unidentified bones. I'm pretty sure they were just a root, but yeah, it was a bit of a freaky experience there. Now day four was less successful in terms of fulfilling our objectives. Steve is a expert at um, bee sonification um, and sonicate, sonication and that's the uh, buzzing of bees and there's lots of flowers in particular the ones in Solanaceae that require to be buzz pollinated for them to release their pollen. Now Amagilla are amazing at this. They should be brilliant to record. They, they probably would be but we found that all our Amagilla dorsoni they were they just wanted to get high on sugar. They were um, only nectaring which was a bit frustrating. We did catch a few recording, but not that many. Uh, we also went to excavate some nests because Steve was studying their nests um, and to get some larvae and do some molecular studies. Uh, so these bees, they nest in clay pans. So we got a good workout that day. Uh, it was beautiful scenery though. And um, so that's just one of the many uh, beautiful landscapes in Australia. Now, the final day um, with these uh, people who, people who I'd um, really enjoyed spending so much time with and being able to talk my language essentially, I really appreciated being able to just buzz about bees with them. Um, so we, set off to do some more nectaring studies. We found a new nesting aggregation just in the middle of a dirt road. We went to find another nesting aggregation. Sadly, it seems like the road had been improved, um, but actually destroyed the nests. Um, so that was a bit sad, but we did find a new nest. So that sort of made up for it. Now, this final day, I decided to introduce my American colleagues to a bit of Australian culture. So there was a local pub and they were having a karaoke evening and that was a lot of fun. And you had your typical Aussie bogan blokes there belting out some ACDC ditties. It was a lot of fun. And um, I, I parted with a really heavy heart. So by Carnarvon, so the, the last day I headed off, I had to see my beautiful Amagilla Dorsoni one last time, stopped off at the rifle range, um, said goodbye some, to, to some mating bees, did a little dance on the clay pan and then headed back to Geraldton with again a lot of stops on along the way because Australia has a lot of amazing beautiful bees. Here's just one example there. And then from Geraldton back home to Perth, I also collected an exciting species there near Pasiphae mirabilis. There's only two species in that genus. One is listed as critically endangered. This one doesn't appear to be endangered, um, but there's no monitoring of almost any native bee species. So we don't know how they're doing. But as you can see, it's a very funky bee. Whilst I had an amazing time with Amagilla dorsoni and with my American colleagues, I was very happy to be home with my gorgeous dog Zephyr as well. So that's a very brief uh, tale of my journey to find Amagilla dorsoni. If you're interested, I've got a more extensive recount and narration of this exciting adventure. If, if you're interested to read about it, please send me an email, which is um, there, kitprendergast21 at gmail.com. And to conclude, I will play you a bit of a video of bees having sex. 
Oh, that didn't work. They really are quite adorable. I'm sure you all agree. Thank you so much for letting me share my tale of the field of Amagula Dorsoni. I've got plenty of other exciting adventures of finding bees in Australia. You can um, follow some of my adventures on my Facebook group, Bees and the Burps. And thank you, ECN, for hosting this symposium. Monkey business is a figurative phrase to indicate mischievous behavior. Sarah and I literally experienced it on a collecting trip. Part one, Kiko. In 2013, Sarah and I had the fortune to collect spolokines in submontane Atlantic forests in the state of Bahia in Brazil. We were the guests of Vitor Becker, a well-known lepidopterist who established the 2,500 hectare Sara Bonita Reserve. There, there is a, a large facility with a dormitory and uh, laboratories, along with a dining hall with great views. During our first morning, while looking at the vista, up pops Kiko, the resident pet capuchin monkey. Kiko likes to hang out on the roof because he gets fed there, along with fruit um, he subsidized his diet with birds. Despite the bird shadows on the large windows, birds crash into the windows. And <clears throat> while we were eating breakfast, a hummingbird crashed into the window. It was a little stunned and was about to fly off when Kiko ran, grabbed it, and bit it dead, much to our disgust. And here he is, enjoying his snack. Uh, returning from the field one afternoon, we noticed Kiko hanging out by our screened in work area. That's where we process our, our wood by uh, splitting it open and excising the beetles out of it. We went into the work area and immediately we noticed the window screen ripped open. Bottles of kerosene and our good ethanol and vials opened and dumped. A groundskeeper reported that he saw Kiko running from the work area with Sarah, Sarah's Leatherman. We later found it down the road about half a kilometer away. Vitor explained that Kiko is very curious and likes to unscrew bottles, so he couldn't resist the temptation of all the new stuff in the workroom. So the cheeky monkey was jailed for the remainder of the time we were there, and that's what happens when you use your opposable thumb for mischief. Part two, Pele. One rainy morning after breakfast, Sarah wasn't feeling so well, so she went back to our room to lay down while I checked out a few light flight intercept traps, and I returned to the room within an hour. Now, I did not have my camera ready to capture the event I'm about to describe, so I rendered my memories in elementary art. I walked into the room. A dark shadow rushed past me towards Sarah. It jumped on the bed and crawled on Sarah. It then stuck her finger in its mouth. She was stunned. I was stunned. I saw King Kong holding Fei Ray. It was a howler monkey. So I grabbed the broom, it's so to look large and menacing. Um, it, it worked, the howler jumped off and Sarah ran out and then I skedaddled. 
We, re we immediately reported to Vitor and explained how a howler monkey came into our room and jumped on Sarah and almost bit off her fingers. He laughed and said, oh, that's just Pele. He was raised as a pet and likes to snuggle in bed when it's raining and he likes suckling on fingers. <laughs> so we recommend visiting Sarah Bonita. The collecting is great and the hosts are full of surprises. Thank you. Hi, folks. I'm Antonio Gomez, and I'm a PhD student at Oregon State University. And I'm here to share my tale from the field, which is uh, titled Halophilic Ground Beetles, Genus Desherius, and Collecting PhD Research Specimens in the Times Before COVID-19. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a PhD student. I'm studying sperm female co-diversification in ground beetles. And in general, ground beetles have some very cool sperm and female reproductive tracts. But I got very interested in the genus Desherius. Here's an example shown here on the left, because they have some very unusual sperm that often shows differences between species. And the female reproductive tracts are also very interesting. Oftentimes they have a very convoluted, tortuous spermathecal tube or storage organ. Uh, and my plan was to go from my university in my town in Western Oregon and go to the American Southwest to collect fresh specimens because you need fresh specimens to be able to extract sperm. Um, and I also needed additional females for reproductive tract data. And so this was a big road trip that is now no longer possible or certainly wouldn't be very safe, I think. Uh, driving from uh, Corvallis down to California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. So what's so special about this area? Well, Texas in particular has um, among the most diverse faunas of the Desherius of all 50 states. There's about 60 Nearctic species of Desherius, 17 of them occur in Texas. And in many cases, you can find multiple species at a single site, which is in my mind, very helpful if you're trying to uh, expand your taxon sampling as much as possible. And they often tend to occur in areas like the uh, image shown here, these, these playas, where you can splash water on the surface and you'll see a lot of the beetles emerge. Um, and so my plan was go there and just collect as many Desherius as I can. And so I, I started actually in Southern New Mexico in a spot called Bottomless Lakes State Park, uh, which is beautiful. There's these big sinkholes and crystal clear water. And I got to spend part of my time there collecting with my older brother and he got to see what night collecting is like and we got to see things like the palo verde beetle and tarantulas walking around at night and it was a lot of fun uh, and then i split off from him and went to uh, texas to continue my search and found myself at beautiful sites like laguna atascosa searching the saline playas at night for beetles and sadly not finding dishurious here and these particular sites i think it maybe would have been a was a little too dry um, and I frequently had to go to areas that I call the mucky muck, or just kind of really muddy, sometimes kind of gross spots that tend to be marshy. And this is oftentimes where I would find Desherius in big numbers. And so a lot of the habitats look like this. And it's the kind of spot where you move a little bit and you sink in and you try to move around and you're kind of stuck. And this is what Desherius often like. Um, Here's a video just to show you kind of what that looks like. I'm sure the, um, the cleaning staff at my motel room later at night were, were always happy with the mess. Now you can see my aspirator going after a beetle, probably a bambidion, not a Desherius, but I definitely did get some Desherius there. All right. I think that gives you a picture of, of collecting these beetles. Now, one of the uh, uh, challenges of collecting uh, these beetles is that I, I need to identify them because I, I needed to know whether it's a species I've already sampled or a species that I haven't sampled yet. 
And in particular, there's a whole host of species that kind of look like this one on the left. Uh, and that the way you distinguish them is by features of cetacean, microsculpture, how rugose the fronds is, and they're all solid characters. The issue is just if you're working with a field scope and dissecting in a campsite or a motel room, it's very difficult to know, is this one worth, it, worth my time or should I focus on another specimen? And so in many cases, especially with these particular species, I just had to go for it and hope that it was, that, that it'd work out and that it'd, it'd be worth my time. And so to give you a sense of kind of what dissecting in the field looks like, here's a, here's a view of the Brownsville, uh, Texas um, Motel 6, which is where I spent a lot, a, lot of my, a lot of my time doing dissections. And then I come back to um, Oregon and kind of hope for the best, because all I have is just a beetle in a vial, uh, the voucher in a vial, and oftentimes sperm on a slide, and that I actually come to the lab in Oregon and fix and stain them. And oftentimes they worked out. Uh, in the case of those beetles that have, uh, that I had mentioned earlier, that have the, the orange tip on their elytra, I think I dissected something like 26 Deshirius hemorrhoidalis, hoping that maybe some of them were species that are lookalikes. And in nearly every case, <laughs> it was actually just Deshirius hemorrhoidalis. And that's how it goes sometimes. But it was still good to get, uh, to get data for those species, and I had a really great time. Thanks for listening, and thank you for letting me share my tale from the field. The year was 2016 in the place Costa Rica, an incredible land full of wonderful people and amazing insects and just beautiful landscapes. If you haven't been there, highly recommend it. This is Gavin Svensson. He makes some really cool UV light traps that had LEDs built into them like this. And my former PI, Hojun Song, really cool character. I'm sure most of you know Hojun. He wanted to bring along some of these traps and try out uh, looking for a thought fair with them. And so he modified some of Gavin's designs and we set them up here and there. And we got some pretty neat stuff. Not a lot of orthoptera, which we got in more, but you know, it is what it is. And one foggy drizzling night in an elevated area surrounded by this immense cloud forest, you can see our vehicle way down there. We climbed up a ways, we set up this UV light uh, uh, setup right near a cliff edge, which you know seemed like a good idea at the time. And at first, we started getting some things drizzling in, uh, moths, uh, mostly, occasionally a small beetle. You know, we're grasshopper people. We, we want to see the orthoptera, or the katydids. Bring them to us. Bring us the grasshoppers in general. We want to see them. Uh, and we kept waiting and waiting. And uh, Barrett, who was there with us, he, he kept looking around going, there's a lot of moths here. There's a lot of moths here. There's a lot of moths here. And they just kept coming and coming and coming. <laughs> And uh, until you had Mothapalooza going on, which if you're into moths, again, you would have been in heaven. And again, moths are cool. We're just not moth people, really. And we're wearing glasses on our eyes, trying to keep them out of our faces. And uh, I've had one go down my ear before, and that was horrifying. So I was covering my ears a lot. and had our, our hats. We're just waving them around. Get out of here, moths. Get out of here. Doing our best to, to ward off all these incredible moths when this happened. Ojun got so excited that I look over and he's gone. Where'd he go? Watch and find out. My PhD. Yeah, he fell off the cliff. One second he's there, next second he's just gone. And luckily, I saw this happen. I reached down and grabbed him. And Ricardo jumped over there too and, and pulled him up with me. And the whole time he's just laughing man, maniacally like, ha 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 ha! I'm like, what, what, what are you doing, man? You almost just fall off the cliff and left us here uh, to, to tell your uh, your wife and kids, who are, by the way, back in the back in the hotel room, what exactly happened. And he's just laughing and laughing. Yeah, you know, stressful laughter, I, I assume. Uh, but it was definitely, definitely scary, but, but fun, you know, overall, and, and, and it worked out, obviously, but whew.
And the usual we think happened. The guy wires, which are set up, you know, holding up the light sheet, and uh, the wires to the the, the battery uh, packs, the power of these these really cool lights. He just tripped over them. <laughs> and uh, it's dark again, hard to see, and the monster is everywhere in your face. And yep, just one second, one thing leads to another, and and off you go off the cliff. Whew. Glad we got your back, Ogie. And shh, don't 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 tell the wife and kids. They they don't know the story. So I'll let you uh, give you this parting shot of the moth diversity, which is just, again, extraordinary. But at the same time, terror-raising, terrifying and amazing. And if I could do it again, I would, but I'd probably bring uh, ear, ear muffs of some kind and and uh, and just, you know, not sit up near a cliff. <laughs> Moral of the story, <laughs> watch over those cliffs. I want to thank everyone in my story for being a good sports about it. And my condolences to Ryan Selking, who, hey man, the one night, the one night that you went to sleep early and you didn't get to see the craziness. And thanks to all the cool Ticos we met along the way in Costa Rica. And of course, to my wife for helping me film this wonderfully poor reenactment. And to my son for the props. And yeah, it may have been his voice. And no, no babies are harmed in the making of this presentation. Until next time. So, just climbed this, it's about uh, 10 meters. Uh, uh, and this is in Panama, where I'm living now, doing a postdoc. But uh, it's been a few years that I had climbed a uh, palm tree for the last time. And, uh, and I wasn't here, it was mostly in Brazil. And that's the story I'm going to talk about today. Every story has a beginning. And for this one, I'd like to go back 15 years ago. This is when I took my first entomology course with the person who taught me everything I needed to start working on palm flower beetles. Sergio Banin was my undergrad and my master thesis advisor. Uh, and he passed away the day I recorded the video you just saw. Um, Vanin is a key person, not only to this story, but also to many, many entomologists and even malacologists in Brazil. Uh, we will deeply miss him, and I'd like to take this opportunity to honor his memory. Um, so it all starts when many years ago, Vanin had been to a mountain range named Serra do Cipó. And, and he collected there many specimens of uh, two species of Ankylorhynchus palm weevils. So he collected on the palm flowers. 
Um, but actually, he didn't know there were two species uh, while he was in the field. He just noticed that in the lab because they are kind of similar looking. Um, and uh, one of them remained undescribed until we met. Um, and uh, another thing he discovered uh, after coming back from the field is that the one really common little palm that was in that locality was actually two palms. And, and so there was this question. So we knew already one of the species was undescribed. We didn't know uh, which one came from which palm if they were specialized. So, um, so the, the, he gave me the task to go back to this location to say how the sipa and sort this out. Um, it's very easy because those are palms, but they're hardly trees. They're super short. Uh, and yes, uh, the end of the story is that uh, there were two species there, each one on a different palm, and eventually uh, we ended up describing one of the, those species. Um, and uh, so back then, that's when I started working on, on palm flower weevils, and I, I did a lot of a little bit of sampling and other species as well. Um, and uh, I focused mostly on, the, on these short palms, so sometimes I tried something a little taller, as you can see. Um, but as usual for tales from the field, there was a turn of events that took me for to a very far, far away country where people have weird customs and such as climbing fake rocks um, in enclosed spaces. Um, I was living among the locals, and so they taught me uh, what they knew. And um, there wasn't, there weren't really any palm trees around, but I, I found that oaks are close enough to practice. And, and, it's, and, and then I acquired this new knowledge, so, so now I could go back to the field in Brazil and really sample all of those palm trees. I, I traveled to a few locations um, in the Amazon by plane, but uh, most of the field uh, consisted, consisted of driving 18,000, a little more than 18,000 miles in six different field trips to sample beetles from flowers of more than 50 species of palm. Um, of course, that's, uh, those are quite long trips, uh, several, several weeks uh, throughout three years in the field. Uh, there are lots of stories, but I, for the sake of time, I summarized one of those trips uh, in, in which we had a little bit of everything. Um, now, let's see it. It's a call. Getting sick, so I'm by myself today. I got the last few samples. Birthday meal. <laughs> <laughs> The last day young. Let's do it. Okay, so that was one of the field trips. Uh, the other ones we had pretty similar stuff hap uh, happening. Going uh, and uh, and now after months of severe lockdown in Panama, 
I'm finally getting my feet muddy again, as you saw in the beginning of this video. So hopefully I'll have uh, Panamanian field stories to tell maybe next year. Um, for now, I'd like to thank you all for watching um, and also the funders, funding sources that made this possible and the people who traveled with me and made uh, all the, these travels not only enjoyable but also efficient. Uh, that includes my wife, Toana Cunha, and also uh, Yang, who we just saw in the short video, and a lot of other people. Uh, thank you all. And um, if there are questions in the session, I'm happy to take any questions. If not, I'll see you around. All right. Well, that's everybody. There is a, uh, uh, we call it a poll it should have popped up on your screen but you can vote for your, your favorite talks and uh we'll base that on uh, the giving out the golden net on on those and now i'm gonna go open up the um meet and greet the happy happy fun time meet and greet if people want to join us over there they can for a little while and the rest of the schedule chris do you want to jump in again i forget when we start again it was like 12 something tst i believe hey yeah let's see we're coming back after a short break at 12.15. Um, certainly have a good uh, meet and greet. Just remember that the code of conduct applies. It's not there just necessarily to protect the ECN, but really to foster a welcoming and diverse audience of all opinions. So please keep that in mind and reach out to me if you have any questions or directly to Christy Bills. So thank you, have a good time. And I'm gonna play some sponsor videos. Thank you again to our sponsors and see you all soon, thanks. Thanks to all your speakers. We want to do this again. Send us some some information. Talk about it again. Thank you.